Minimizing unwanted effects is something everyone strives for. That's why microdosing is effective, because you derive the maximum benefit from taking the minimum effective dose. People microdose for many different reasons. Mental health, wellness, performance. I like to use microdose to help with sleep hygiene. On Friday night at the end of my work week, it helps me catch up on all that much-needed sleep. Today's podcast is sponsored by Microdose Gummies and Lumi Labs. Microdose Gummies deliver perfect, entry-level doses of THC that help you feel just the right amount of good. I love this company and personally use their products. The gummies are organic, infused with real fruit, vegan-friendly, gluten-free, and they taste good. Microdose is available nationwide. To learn more about microdosing THC, Go to microdose.com and use code BEYOND to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Links can be found in the show description, but again, that's microdose.com and code B-E-Y-O-N-D. This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. In a few weeks, I'll be spending some time in Chattanooga, and I'll be staying in an Airbnb on Signal Mountain. So that got me thinking about this crime. This case was very high profile, and there were two murder trials. All the evidence was circumstantial, and the convicted son believes his father was innocent. You're listening to Episode 84, The Signal Mountain Murders. 20-year-old Kenneth Griffith and 20-year-old Earl Schmack had been granted weekend leave from the Elgin Air Force Base in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, where they worked as combat engineers. The two men headed to Signal Mountain to visit 47-year-old Richard Mason, who was Kenneth's father-in-law. Signal Mountain sits about 20 minutes outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and is on Walden Ridge on the southern end of the Cumberland Plateau. This suburb of Chattanooga holds less than 9,000 residents. On July 9, 1988, Kenneth, Earl, and Richard hopped on four-wheelers and headed out to Blue Hole, which was a local swimming hole. A side note, there are several swimming holes in that area that have blue in their name, so the exact location of this particular blue hole is a bit unclear. Earl brought his ATV from Florida. Richard only had one ATV, and had to borrow another one from his neighbor Stanley Nixon, so Kenneth had something to ride. Dusk set on Signal Mountain, and the three men on ATVs never returned home. Kenneth's wife, Paula Griffith, was worried, and she called Stanley Nixon, who had lent the group his ATV. Stanley tried to track down the missing men and saw four-wheeler tracks close to Richard Mason's home. He followed the tracks to Helican Road, which led to a swimming area known as the Blue Hole. Stanley continued on to Vandergriff Road, but the area was paved, and that was where the tracks ended. On July 11, 1988, law enforcement was involved, and in searching Helican Road, looking for the missing men. Helican Road was not even a road, so much as it was a trail, which crossed Frank Castile's property. It was also the path that led to the Blue Hole Swimming Hole. Detective Larry Sneed found Kenneth's knife in the grass and found drag marks on the road that led to a tree. There was blood and possible brain tissue at the base of that tree. They brought in a cadaver dog and uncovered chips from a human skull that were hidden under leaves. There was also a large pool of blood. The skull had markings that were consistent with a shotgun pellet. A nearby tree appeared to have shed its bark by a shotgun blast. Investigators labeled this crime scene number two. 
they eventually found the ATVs on Roberts Mill Road at an illegal dump site. Two of the machines were covered in blood, and bone chips were recovered from one ATV. Later, it was determined that the skull fragments had been shattered from a bullet. The third ATV was clean, and Kenneth's pistol was wrapped in a towel found under the seat. Investigators labeled this crime scene number one. Once the word got out about the discovery of the ATVs, Lee Griffith, who was the brother of one of the victims, was driving to his mom's because he needed to tell her the news. Unfortunately, his car broke, and he flagged down help. Someone offered Lee a ride in a Jeep. The owner of this vehicle was Frank Castile. Lee noticed the back of the Jeep was wet, which made little sense as it had not been raining. But as the investigation unfolded, law enforcement grew more invested in Frank Castile. One detective asked some of the local property owners to stop by the area they were searching. Frank Castile showed up and consented to the search of his Jeep. During that search, the investigator uncovered a logbook. Frank logged every trespasser who stepped onto his property. All their names, telephone numbers, and license plates were documented there. Frank was asked about his gun collection, and he allowed law enforcement to take a shotgun for analysis. Later on, the ballistics analysis returned an indeterminate result. The gun may or may not have been used in the crimes. Frank Castile was considered a suspect, but was never charged. On Monday, July 11th, 1988, Portia McDowell set out walking on Big Fork Road. She did this walk often and passed by a dump. But she noticed it had been cleaned and there was a distinct odor. She mentioned something to her husband, Bernie, so he went to the dump on Wednesday, July 13th, 1988. The dump smell was awful, and there was a lot of flies. He discovered the bodies of Kenneth, Earl, and Richard, which were mixed in with debris. Investigators labeled this crime scene number three. Dr. Frank King conducted the autopsies, and he confirmed the skull fragments found at crime scene number two matched Kenneth Griffith. Kenneth sustained a gunshot to the left side of his head. The shooter was standing over him when the shot was fired. The bullet entered his left ear and exited out the other side of his head. It appeared they dragged him on the dirt road, as there were scrape marks on his chest. Rose Smock was shot twice at close range in the right shoulder and chest. The first shot would have knocked him to the ground. The shooter stood over him and shot a second time. Earl was shot once with birdshot, and a second time with buckshot. They shot Richard Mason at close range in the chest with buckshot. The medical examiner believed that the three men were possibly shot with three different guns. Investigators didn't have enough evidence to arrest anyone, but Frank Castile was high on their list of people to keep their eye on. Frank Castile had recently purchased 130 acres close to the Blue Hole Swimming Hole, by Helican Road. Many people have been crossing Castile's land to get to the swimming hole as they considered it public land. But the trespassers angered Castile. People would litter, drop empty beer cans, and smoke weed. So he kept a logbook and tracked every person who trespassed on his property. People started talking and shared their stories of their scary run-ins with Frank Castile. Most of the stories were similar. People headed to the Blue Hole to go swimming, and Castile would meet them with a shotgun pointed at them. He would take their information and would tell them to leave his property as he rested his finger on the trigger of the shotgun. As investigators had discovered and labeled all the crime scenes and spoke with Castile, they never tested his hands for gunpowder. Frank wasn't the only person who investigators were watching, though. Cecil Hickman was also known for brandishing his weapon to strong-arm trespassers. Richard Mason, who was the oldest victim, and his neighbor Stanley, had a memorable altercation with Cecil Hickman. Cecil had been the caretaker of all those acres of property in Signal Mountain prior to Castile purchasing it. 
Eight months prior to the murders, Richard Mason and Stanley Nixon had been hunting. When Richard went one way, and Stanley went another. Stanley firmly believed that they were on a neighbor's land, but he ran into Cecil Hickman and his two sons, who were all armed. Stanley was told to leave. He said he would leave, but he needed to grab Richard. Cecil Hickman pointed his pistol into the air and fired three times. Richard and Stanley left the woods in one piece. A few days later, Stanley and Richard were driving and saw Cecil Hickman walking down the road. Richard aggressively swerved his car towards Hickman to send him a message about their transgression in the woods. Cecil returned that message by pulling out his pistol and shaking it at the men. When investigators questioned Cecil Hickman, he claimed he was in Kentucky when the murders took place. However, a witness came forward and said they saw Cecil Hickman's two sons pushing two ATVs off the back of a truck into a legal dumping site on the night of July 9, 1988. They did not initially report this to police, out of fear or retribution by the Hickman family. No arrests were made, and eight years passed. Investigators didn't have much to grasp onto until 1996. During that summer, Frank Castile reconnected with his high school sweetheart, Marie Hill, despite actively being married to Susie Castile. Shortly after this affair began, Marie received a letter in August from an anonymous party. It contained newspaper clippings about the Signal Mountain murders. Marie showed Castile the letter, and he told her he had been questioned since the murders were close to his property. Marie received a second letter, and the writer claimed to have witnessed Castile killing Kenneth, Richard, and Earl. When she showed this letter to Castile, he denied having committed the crime. Marie gave both letters to Frank Castile, but later on, she asked for them back. He handed the letters over, but when she left the room, he switched one letter and left a blank sheet of paper in its place. Eventually, Marie discovered he had deceived her. She confronted Castile, and he denied the bait and switch, but eventually owned up to taking the letter, as he was worried it would cause issues for him. Marie's neighbors received letters saying that she was dating a murderer. She had enough of all the letters and went to the police, and she allowed them to bug her home. They wanted Marie Hill to get Frank Castile to confess to the murders. On October 12, 1996, at 2.30 a.m., Castile and Marie were at her home when Susie Castile arrived to confront them both. This uncomfortable situation of Frank with both his mistress and his wife turned into a five-hour conversation, which investigators taped and eventually played at trial. Castile never once confessed or admitted that he had anything to do with the murders, but this conversation didn't paint him in the best light. Castile's previous violent acts against his wife were revealed. Mrs. Castile also ended a relationship with a man because she was scared what Frank might do to him. It was also revealed that he had held his kids at gunpoint. Susie Castile said that Frank called the police officer a pig. He elaborated and said he called many cops pigs because he thought a lot of cops were indeed pigs. In this five-hour, secretly recorded conversation, there were some vague references and veiled language that would be interpreted different ways at trial. But there was no ultimate admission of guilt from Frank Castile. After this conversation, Castile's home was raided by the police. They had a search warrant and took 44 items, including a shotgun and ammunition, as they searched for the letter that he took from Marie Hill. On April 15, 1997, they charged Frank Castile with the murders of Kenneth Griffith, Earl Smock, and Richard Mason. The defense petitioned the court for a change of venue because of the high-profile nature of this case, which was granted. The jury was selected in Loudoun County, just outside of Knoxville, and was transported to Hamilton County in Chattanooga for the trial. 
Castile had an extensive number of confrontations with trespassers that his attorney wanted excluded from the trial. This motion was denied. The trial began in May 1998. Eighteen witnesses testified that Frank Castile had confronted them for trespassing. David Mosteller testified that one month before the murders, he and his friends, Alan and Derek, drove to the Blue Hole to go swimming. Before they reached their destination, they were met by the defendant, who pointed a shotgun at them. The man flat out told them to stay off his property, or he would shoot them. Michael Killingsworth and Deanne Kennedy testified that on June 11, 1988, they drove with a group of people to the Blue Hole. Like others, they were met by a man pointing a shotgun at them. It was a serious encounter, as this man rested the shotgun on the inside of the window of the vehicle and cocked it. Terry Mills said that on the day of the murders, he drove to the Blue Hole with his friend, Jeff Mann. As they approached the Blue Hole, they were met by an angry man pointing a shotgun at them. This man brought them to a nearby campsite where he told them to record their names and vehicles in a logbook. After speaking with the defendant for a short time, Terry and Jeff left the area. Vince Brown testified that on April 17, 1988, he drove to the Blue Hole with his cousin. The defendant met them with a shotgun and accused them of trespassing. Castile recognized the cousin and backed off a little. He asked them to fill out his logbook. Castile said maybe they could go hunting on his property sometime. Vince Brown said that on the day of the murders, he was helping a friend back a moving truck onto the tight mountain road. He had to stop traffic, and Frank Castile and his wife were in their Jeep Scrambler, which was muddy. Vince struck up a conversation and learned that the Castiles were going camping. Vince was about a mile away from the defendant's property that evening, visiting with friends, when he heard gunshots between 6 and 8 p.m. Two days later, Vince saw that Castile and the Jeep had been washed. Donald Jones testified that he and his wife, along with another couple, went to the Blue Hole to camp on the weekend of July 4th. Unlike the others, Castile's wife stopped them. Frank and Susie Castile spoke over a two-way radio, and he told her to hold the people there until he arrived. Castile showed up with a gun, and he had everyone write their names and license plate numbers into his book. He told them they could not camp there, and should go to Big Fork to camp, then sent them on their way. On May 1, 1988, Steve Craig and his friend were approached by the defendant, who told them that they could swim if they picked up trash. Steve called Castile on July 6, 1988, and the defendant said he didn't have a problem with people driving trucks on his property, but it was those damn four-wheelers. He'd shoot one of them if he had to. Several others testified, including Judith Lowry, her husband, children, and friends. Gary McDowell and his wife with an incident on May 15, 1988. Paul Meeks with an incident on July 4, 1988. And Jonathan Utwan with his friend, Michael Dantzler, with an incident in April 1988. The defendant's alibi was he was camping and celebrating his anniversary on the weekend of the murders. His wife testified that they spent their wedding anniversary camping on their land and also swimming in the Blue Hole. They cut their celebration short when their dog got sick, so they went home early. Frank Castile's neighbor, William Wiggins, also heard shots between 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. coming from Castile's land. There were five to eight shots fired within a 10-second time frame. Witness Mildred Hines saw a Jeep loaded up with one to two ATVs on Sawyer Road. Witness Pam O'Neill was camping on a property that was next to Frank Castile's land. She heard ATVs cross in her property, and then she heard gunshots. Pam woke up at 2 a.m., and decided she had enough camping. She and her husband packed up, and she too saw a Jeep driving down Sawyer Road. Several witnesses saw a Jeep on Sawyer Road and reported that a female was driving the Jeep with a dog in the back. On the next day, at a car wash, witness John Lyons saw a woman washing blood out of the back of a Jeep. When John asked the woman about the blood, she explained it was pig blood, 
as she had just brought the pig to be slaughtered. John felt the woman was suspicious, and he wrote her license plate number from her Jeep. Later on, he saw Frank Castile driving that same Jeep. When he checked the license plate number, it matched what he had written down that day at the car wash. Many witnesses came forward and reported hearing several shots fired by Helican Road between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. on July 9, 1988. One witness reported seeing a Jeep with a blue tarp in the back. Police also found blue plastic and a metal grommet in the fire pit at Frank Castile's campsite. Another witness saw a jeep at the legal dump site, where the four-wheelers were discovered. Law enforcement believed that Castile drove the ATVs to the dump site, one by one. But it was unclear how they could be loaded into the jeep, as they weighed a few hundred pounds each, and would be too heavy for one person to load. The defense reiterated, investigators never tested his hands for gunpowder. And the gunshot casings did not match Castile's gun. The prosecutor's message to the jury was that Frank Castile was cruel and deceptive, as evidenced by the five-hour taped conversation between Frank Castile, his wife, and his mistress. He told his mistress that he loved her and didn't love his wife. While no one saw Frank Castile commit the murders, He was camping less than a mile away from the murder site. A blue tarp was possibly used to cover the bodies of the victims as they were transported to the dump site. And they found pieces of a blue tarp that were burned in Castile's fire pit at his campsite. A shotgun or shotguns were used in committing the murders. A shotgun or shotguns were used in committing the murders. And Castile was known for threatening trespassers with a shotgun. Gunshots were heard coming from his property on the night of the murders. He had a special disdain for four-wheelers driving on his property. He was seen transporting ATVs on the night of the murders. Witnesses heard his loud jeep on the mountain in the middle of the night. A woman was washing blood out of the back of his jeep the day after the murder. It only took the jury one hour and 45 minutes to find Frank Castile guilty on three counts of first-degree murder. In 2001, Frank Castile appealed his conviction, and the courts overturned it. They granted him a new trial because some of the original evidence should have never been admissible, including the taped five-hour confession. Frank's wife, Susie, admitted to writing the letters to his mistress that accused him of murder. She was trying to scare Marie Hill away from her husband because she wanted their affair to end. DNA testing on one letter showed it had been handled by Susie Castile. In 2003, Frank Castile had a second murder trial, but the outcome was the same. On May 7th, they convicted him of the murders of Kenneth Griffith, Earl Smock, and Richard Mason. He was eligible for parole in 2024, but in June 2019, Frank Castile passed away in prison at age 71. His son Trevor maintains that his father was innocent and wrote a book called Statement of Facts, which outlines all the issues with the state's case against his father. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for the links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and sound design were performed by me, Renee. If you like the show, please leave me a positive review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.